Ministry of Presence. If you are visiting with us, we have some connection cards that I don't, can't put my hands immediately on, and Lee's going to grab one and hand it to me. We're so glad for all of you who were here, and a special warm welcome to our guests. These are really for you. We want to be of service to you in any way that we can, and we want to enrich your spiritual journey in any way that we are able to, and you can share some information with us if you choose. For our members, just a reminder that if you have a prayer concern that you would like to share with our prayer team that meets on Thursdays, there's a space in here for that as well. You can, you can place those prayer concerns anonymously. You're welcome to indicate who you are and, and who it is for, but we want to make sure that you have this opportunity to uh, have your prayer needs shared in that way as well. Do any of you all have any announcements? If so, just raise your hand and... Someone will bring you a microphone, Miss Joyce. Can I preach this morning? Oh, well, I guess so. <laughs> I've had such an experience this week that you just will not believe that I did what I did. But anyway, this wonderful girl from this church gave me some things to give other people. And while I was going, she suggested who I should give them to. And while I was going through these things, and we have talked about angels all this month and about what God has done for other people. Something came to me and told me they will not go there. They will go somewhere else. So I went through those things, and I packaged them up just as neat and nice as I could. And I said, can I do this? Please tell me if I can do it. So Friday afternoon, I headed out, and I parked illegally and went and knocked on the door. <laughs> and I said, can I come in? He said, sure, you can come in. So this, they were just as welcoming to me as anything I've ever been in my life. And this was at the Boys and Girls Club. And when I walked in, they were playing basketball, and I got real happy, and he said, oh, come join us. <laughs> happy as it could be to see me. Well, those wonderful things that this girl gave me from the church went to the Boys and Girls Club, and they were ecstatic about that. So I'll be going back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> Any other announcements that you all might have? Just a quick reminder, it's in your bulletin, but we will be having Vacation Bible School this week. If you would like to participate in that, see Jillian about some ways I'm sure she could use some additional help, though I think we have a number of volunteers, but your presence is always appreciated. We also started the summer feeding program this past week. It's a wonderful success. Um, the day I was there, there were a number of children, and I think they had as many as 22 on Friday. So this is an important ministry. If, if you would like to participate in that, they have to do just a very, uh, they can do it pretty quickly, a background check, but um, it's worth your while. The, the two hours that I was there this week, it was one of the highlights of the week. It's a very rewarding experience. I'm going to be away. You may have noticed Carol is not here this weekend. She's doing a, a wedding for a family member in Athens, Georgia. Um, just real quickly, I want to tell you, she is, you all know, she's extraordinary, but she never ceases to amaze me. This past week, we realized she shared with us in our ministry team meeting that she was leaving Thursday afternoon by train to head toward Atlanta that she was going to stop somewhere halfway along the way would be at a train station in the middle of the night and then would arrive in Atlanta at something like 7.30 or 8 o'clock the next morning with her train. And it didn't phase her at all. And as far as how she's getting back, she's not sure yet, but she's not worried about it in the least. <laughs> she knows she'll get back. <laughs> she can handle herself. She'll, we'll see her next week. I'll be away this week, so you all will get a break from me and my long-winded self next Sunday. Jillian's going to do the message, and I know you know how talented she is at everything she does, so you'll be looking forward to that. Any other announcements that we can share? All right, well, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning and happy Sunday. Good morning. Would you please stand as you're able and join me in the responsive call to worship.
In baptism, we are promised new life, God of grace. Yet, Yet we, we often focus on those old ways, which are so comfortable and seductive. We have been called to walk with you, and yet we run down paths paved with foolishness and fears. Forgive us, God of steadfast love. You have claimed our lives in baptism, so we might be set free from the power of sin and death. Therefore, let us walk in newness of life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> seated. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. Lord, as we breathe in your word, your presence, and your unrelenting love during this time of worship together, help us to go out into the world and breathe it out, out to souls that are lost and to people who need it most. Help us to show your love, mercy, and kindness to a world that is hurting. God, we are so blessed to have a safe place, a home where we can learn more about you. Lead us, please, and guide us as we go out from this place, being your disciples, showing the world your love, and being a light to shine in the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry, I told you guys to sit way too early. <laughs> My bad. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, 
and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. This is the word of God for the people of God. And now can the children please come forward for the children's moment. I hope we never take for granted the privilege we have as a community of faith, honestly, that we get to share our concerns with one another. One of the great aspects of the church is that we don't have to carry burdens that would be too difficult for us to shoulder on our own. There are some things in life that we simply cannot carry on our own. With our faith in God, we are encouraged and we find strength. But there are times, and we've always been there, we've all been there at some point where we need 
the strength and the support of our community. And as a community of faith, we do have that opportunity to share our concerns. We also know that our joys are magnified when we're able to share our joys in community. So if you have any joys or concerns that you would like to share, we invite you to do so at this time. Any joys or concerns? B? I'll start with a, a concern. Um, Rayford Garish, who uh, it happens to be the husband of my hairdresser, uh, as of Wednesday was in a drug-induced coma because he had a seizure while at work. He, he, he works logging, and so he was on a big piece of equipment and suffered a terrible seizure. So uh, he'd been on uh, a ventilator for nine days, and they were going to have to intubate him as of the next day. So I haven't heard how he's doing, but please keep Rayford Garish in your prayers. Um, then a joy, and I don't have a name for this person, but I had a telephone call on Wednesday sent from a, someone who works at the hospital here in Beaufort County saying she was, she was an employee of the hospital and normally they don't get involved with helping people get set up in homes and so forth, but somebody had given her my name because of CIA and she came over to the mission building and found furniture for this man who'd been in the hospital for 30 days, whose family had deserted him, 80 years old, and he's the, the employees of the hospital are getting together to get a truck to come over and pick up what this man needs. It lives in their community. God lives. Thank you. Thank you. Other joys or concerns? Maggie? Just a brief update on Bob. Uh, nine treatments down, uh, approximately 26 to go. He's not in pain, so he's eating <laughs> and um, maintaining his weight. He's very tired, but um, we really feel the prayers. Um, you know, as long as he can eat and not be in pain, I can deal with tired. You know, we can get, we, we can get through that. So I appreciate your support and prayers. Thank you, Maggie. I call your attention to your bulletins as you open them up. When you first open them, the page that is folded should have those serving this Sunday. Do you see that at the top of the page? Mm -hmm. And then below are our prayer concerns that you can look to. You can carry these with you. This is one of the ways that we stay united as a community of faith, having gone to one bulletin each week so that we can share these concerns across worship services. And then I want you to see the congregational care team contact information. This week it'll be Mike. You want to stand for just a second, Mike? So if you have any congregational care needs, thank you. Um, you can reach out to him. You can call the office if you need to get his <coughs> phone number. But we have a wonderful congregational care team that has put in place, went through weeks of training and preparation and equipment so that they can provide the care that this congregation so well deserves. Any other joys or concerns that you would like to share? All right, let's go to God in prayer together. Gracious God, in the stillness of this place, we know that you are with us. We know that it is in you that we move and breathe and have our very being. We thank you that you are the very source of our lives, that you woke us up this morning and that we are blessed to have another day on this earth. We thank you for the relationships that we celebrate, many of whom are gathered in this place of worship. We thank you that we are united by our common love for you and out of our love for you, we are strengthened and empowered to love one another and to love ourselves in ways that we would be incapable of apart from you. Oh God, we've come for many and varied reasons. Some of us are here seeking hope and encouragement. Some of us are seeking a clear path for the future that seems uncertain. Some of us are here seeking healing, healing within our bodies, healing within our emotions, healing within our relationships. We thank you that whatever we're seeking, we know the one to whom we are to go. We thank you that you hear us when we pray. And not only do you hear us, but you respond to us. We're here also, O oh God, to draw closer to you, to draw closer to one another, but we are here to learn more about how we can be followers of Jesus. 
We're here to draw close with listening ears to his teachings. We're here to discover anew who you are, who we've been called to be. We thank you that we realize that both of these revelations were present in the person of Jesus. We thank you that through him we come to the realization, the recognition, that you are primarily a God of love and from you we can never ultimately be separated. We thank you that that has been made possible in the one who perfected your love and dealt the final blow to that which could separate us. Just as Jesus came proclaiming in word and deed your reconciling love, restoring relationships, we pray that we would continue to grow in that perfect love and that we as Christ will be a light to the world, that we too will be a people of peace, a people of res restoration, a people of reconciliation. We know that the challenge before us is not an easy one, but we thank you that we're not on our own. We thank you for those to our right and to our left. We thank you for those who have become before us in this, our church. We thank you for the strength that we draw from our faith. And we thank you for the power that comes through prayer, even the prayer that Christ taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
are so very fortunate as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ that communion is the central act of our worship service. It is central because this is one of the ways that God so powerfully reveals to us the length to which God will go to restore broken community. We've heard just a moment ago in Paul's letter to the church in Rome, and we'll hear again in just a few moments the length to which God in Christ will go to reveal God's perfect love. It is love that empowers us. It is love that overcomes the power of sin, and sin understood is that which separates us from God and one another. Every person is worthy to celebrate communion. Our, worthy, our worthiness is not found in and of ourselves. Our worthiness is found in the love of God because God's love is a value-creating love. <laughs> We are valuable because God loves us. And because God loves us, we have infinite value. All who are seeking to encounter that love anew is welcome to celebrate communion with us this morning. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to this table and we come with joy in our hearts while some of us have sorrow in our hearts. We come to this table and we know that you love us. We know that you love us because you sent your only son your son whose precious body was broken and is represented in this bread that we take today. We take this bread and we hope that it fills us all and it restores us all so that we can go out and speak of your love and your son's love for us and for all that we meet in the coming week. Gracious God, we are blessed without measure for the opportunity to come again to your table this morning. We know that each person here has been called by name and led to this place. As this cup is passed, we will remember the cross and the love poured out for us there. By the fullness of your grace, Father, we have received the precious gift of salvation, not earned but freely given. We will rejoice in you always. Amen. Amen. On that night in the upper room with his disciples, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you partake of it in remembrance of me.
the love of Christ, the blood of the new covenant. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We now have the opportunity, and it is just that, is an opportunity, not out of compulsion or obligation, but out of a sense of gratitude with the recognition that all that we have is a gift from God, all that is good in our lives. We're grateful for this church. We're grateful for each person that makes up the body of Christ. Those who came before us out of their generosity made it possible for us to gather as a community of faith. We've heard about a number of the ministries that happen in and through our congregation. I am so grateful to be a part of this community of faith, and I'm so grateful for all of you, as I know God is, for your generosity. We'll now receive our tithes and offerings. Dear God, as we come today to lay our offering to our Lord, we give thanks to him for giving us life and life so abundantly. Beautiful words do not make a prayer. The love of us who pray makes prayer come alive. Drawing near to God, not asking for this or that, we need to give praise and thanks, not what we get, but what we may give. As the hymn goes, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Praise be to God. Amen. I think we can agree that that prayer was both eloquent and full of love and power. <laughs> Our reading continues in... Paul's letter to the church in Rome, and we're picking up in the eighth chapter. We'll be reading verses one through four. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us 
who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. May our lives be transformed by the reading and hearing of these words. Amen. How many of you know that God still sends prophets to let God's people go? We are talking this morning about the reality of sin. We're having to deal with one of those subjects that for most of us we would really rather not deal with. Only about once a year do I address this topic specifically. It's discussed and addressed indirectly in a number of ways throughout the year, but I think it's important for us to deal with this reality of sin, deal with what is often actualized in our personal and corporate lives, even though it's not one of the most fun subjects to talk about. I love how Jillian could make humor of it because it is important for us to be able to laugh at ourselves, but it is also important that we deal with something of a serious topic, a serious reality, and that reality is sin. For many of us, we have some conception of sin. 
For some of us, it's somewhat of an elementary understanding of sin. For others of us, we have firsthand experience of a lot of sin, so we know it better than we can articulate it. And some of us have had the opportunity to explore it, at least conceptually, what it means, this concept, this notion of sin that has plagued humanity ever since the creation of humanity. When we think of sin, what comes to mind? Again, during the children's message, it's almost like the word sin itself is an ugly word, some kind of bad word. Certainly, and rightfully so, there is often a negative connotation that is associated with sin. But what is sin? Is it those things that we do? Is God keeping score of those things that we have done wrong or those things that we have neglected to do? Is it primarily about a code of ethics that we are to live up to? And if we do not live up to this code of ethics, then we have sinned. Does it mean to fall short? Some people understand sin as missing the mark, as in archer's terms, where they bring the arrow back, they let the arrow go. If it misses the target, that is sin. It has missed the mark. A moment ago, we heard of sin in the understanding of separation, that which causes separation. We were created in the image of God, and there was perfect community when we were created. That was the original intent and design to be in perfect relationship with God and one another. But something happened. There's a gone wrongness within ourselves, within our communities, within our societies, even within those relationships that we hold dearest and nearest. When we're honest, we recognize that occasionally there are those things that separate us. So we recognize that sin is separation, particularly in the sense of relationships. We as the Christian church disciples of Christ, part of our mission is to be a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. I love that statement. It really captures what a church, a denomination, the manifestation of the body of Christ all over the world should be about. A movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. We live in a world that is fragmented. Sin, most essentially, has to do with our relationships. I don't believe it's a code of ethics. I don't believe it has to do with a law as it was once understood, as Paul described in his letter to the church in Rome. It's not merely a code of ethics. It's not merely about a moral law. It's about relationships. Sin affects every area of our relationships. For many of us, we understand sin primarily in personal terms. If we can clean up our personal lives, then we can be better people and we have a closer relationship with God. And that is true in part. For some of us, we think that we need to get over whatever personal vices we may have. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't hang out with those who do. Once we get rid of our vices, then all will be well. There are some of us that realize that sin goes beyond just our personal sins, that sins can become corporate, sins can become systemic, they can become even institutionalized. There are systems that are sinful. And there are some who have cleaned up a lot of their personal lives who feel that they've got it okay now because they no longer have those vices that once controlled their lives. But sin is lurking at every corner, and we are involved and complicit in sins in ways that we don't even fully realize. Anything we participate in that causes suffering of other people that diminishes the dignity and the value, the infinite value of another human being is sinful. And we're often complicit in systemic sin in ways that we're not even mindful of. The coffee we drink that was gleaned from a farm where someone can no longer afford to live. The clothes that we wear that are made in sweatshops. The, ones, the clothes that we can get at discount prices because a child is working in slave labor to produce the clothes that we wear. The list could go on and on of the ways that we are complicit unwittingly in things that cause suffering for other people, that damage the relationship they have between God and with one another. So we want to grow in our understanding of sin so that we can overcome with sin. We want to deal with the subject of sin so that we can deal with sin in our lives, in our personal and in our corporate lives. So let's talk a little bit more about sin conceptually just for a moment. There have been a number of people who were faithful and one of the ways they were called to live out their faith, their primary vocation, was to become a theologian. A theologian is one who shares insights with us. They have a ministry of the word. They have a ministry to share with us ways that we can better understand how we relate to God, how God relates to us, and how God desires for us to relate 
to one another. And there have been people throughout history who have offered us wonderful insights into the various natures of our life, our community life with God and with one another. One is one that is very familiar to you, and that is St. Augustine. Sometimes we pronounce his name St. Augustine. St. Augustine understood sin. He considered himself to be a highly sinful person at one particular place in his life, and he always considered himself more or less a deeply sinful person. But he understood sin in this way, and I thought it was fascinating. He saw sin as a misdirection of love, misguided love. We have misprioritized our loves. He says that we begin to love God as a means to our ends, and we love God's creation as an end in itself. We love the things of God more than we love God. But when we do that, we find ourselves incomplete. He says the heart is restless until it finds rest in thee, O God, not in the things of God. That the only thing that can satisfy the longing of the human heart is a relationship with God, a prioritization of God, a love for God has to be the priority. And every breakdown that we see within us in our relationships, in our personal lives, in our, on an international scale, and even within God's creation, even the stewardship of creation comes down to a misdirected love and the wrong priorities of how we love. So sin is misdirected love is how St. Augustine understood it. People have understood our human condition in a number of ways throughout history, again, since the beginning of creation. We know that we were created perfectly in the image of God, but we know that there was a fall. Now, there has been a great deal of debate among those who are very brilliant and also faithful, and among them, there is debate about the human condition. If we fell, how far did we fall? Are we completely and utterly depraved so that there is no good thing in us? That is what it means to be human, that we are depraved, that we are wretched, wicked souls, helpless, that we fell all the way. There are some, as we moved into the Enlightenment, who believe that we really are essentially good, that really our thinking got off course. If we could educate humanity, if we could change humanity's thinking, then we could be restored. We could be good people. In fact, we are good people, and you can trace goodness and evil back to people's thoughts. So if we better educate people, we'll realize that we can end the world's social ills. We can end our own personal ills, that we can create for those who are religious, atheistic people, those who believe in God, that we can actually create of this world heaven on earth, that we are called to do that. With a little bit of re-education, we can do that. There was a person in the early part of the 20th century that I want to call your attention to. And now, please, when I say his name, just stay with me. I share some of these names because they're important. These people have had wonderful contributions to make. And I cannot claim this profound thought of my own, but I find it very illuminating, his remarks on the nature of personal and corporate sin. Reinhold Niebuhr was an early 20th century theologian who was considered a Christian realist. He was not an optimist. He was not a pessimist. He was an equal opportunity offender because he offended both the so-called conservatives and the so-called liberals. He had an understanding of sin that was informed both biblically, but he also surveyed history. He wanted to look at the human condition as it actually is, as it is actualized. And in the beginning part of the 20th century, moving into the mid part of the 20th century, he realized that liberalism was missing something. This optimism in humanity and what we were going to accomplish if we could just educate people was not coming to fruition. We had World War I, we had World War II, we were just coming as a country out of slavery. Women were just beginning to have the right to vote. In our country there were still people who were desperately poor while there were people who were extraordinarily rich. We had not ended poverty or hunger. We had not eliminated sickness and disease that could be treated. So with all of this optimism, why is it that we still find ourselves in our current condition? And he said it was because we had not taken sin seriously. And he offered us an insight into how he defined sin. He said sin is a part of the human condition that is not necessary, but it is ultimately inevitable. What did he mean by that? He says that we have limited self-transcendence. We as human beings have limited self-transcendence. We can anticipate the future and we can remember the past. And in our anticipation of the future, we know that we are finite beings. And because we are finite beings, we begin to fear our own mortality. There's a state of anxiety that's going on within us. It's unconscious often. 
It's something we push way down, but there's a state of anxiety. And due to our anxiety about our own mortality, we seek to anesthetize ourselves, to numb ourselves, that experience of anxiety that we would have otherwise by immersing ourselves and indulging in life's otherwise natural vitalities. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be food, it can be drink, it can be the acquiring of things, but we do these things to anesthetize ourselves from the anxiety we feel on a fundamental level. And in that anxiety, when we engage beyond the limits or what are healthy for us in God's design, that's when we enter into the category of sin, that reality of sin. Now that's on the personal level. He also says that we are by and large self-interested, that this makes up the human condition. We have a preoccupation with that which is in our own interest, what benefits us. And we begin to engage in societies that will reinforce that which is in our own interest. And he says we can begin to participate in a society, again, unwittingly, we're unconscious of this. If we are people who are in places of relative privilege and relative power, we will say to ourselves that the society in which we live is a just, a free, and an equal society because we need to believe that we live in a just and a free and an equal society so that we can continue to be benefited from that society. And we will surround ourselves with people who are also beneficiaries of that society, people who are relatively privileged, and then we reinforce together our own self-interest. Now he says this, the moment it is no longer in our self-interest to participate in that society, we will often abandon that society for another one that will reinforce that which is in our own self-interest. And this is not only an issue with those who are in, in places of power and privilege. He says those who are oppressed, those who are pre persecuted by a certain society, if there ever comes a time in which they can participate in that society that once oppressed them, they will become the most ardent defenders of that society. That's an interesting recognition, isn't it? So there's no need to strictly demonize those who are in places of power and privilege or to romanticize those who are not. Everywhere we look, there is this self-interest lurking around, whether personally or corporately. It's a serious matter that we have to deal with because it does fragment community. It does prevent us from experiencing that which God intends for us to experience. So how does this play itself out in our everyday lives? I think it happens sometimes in very subtle ways. It happens oftentimes in society. We don't know that something's out of the will of God because everybody's doing it. That's just what people do. We're born into those societies and we participate in those societies and everybody's doing it, so it must be okay. There are some of us that deal with sin based on its consequences. Most of us live by the 11th commandment. How many of you know the 11th commandment? Thou shall not get caught. We live in that such a way, caught by our peers or caught by God. If it's not affecting us in our personal lives and it's not showing up in any kind of consequential way that we can see, then perhaps we can neglect to deal with these things. We deceive ourselves. For some of us, we ignore those things that by the Spirit of God, God has brought to our consciousness. We ignore it. There's a danger in that as well. If we ignore it long enough, that danger alarm will stop sounding. It'll start sounding in our consciousness. It'll start, stop sounding in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirits. And I'll give you an example. When I was early in college, I visited a friend who was living in an apartment and his resources were low. He was living on ramen noodles and many of his resources were going to less important things. And so he wouldn't even replace the battery in his fire alarm. What happens with a fire alarm if you don't replace the battery? It begins to chirp and make this obnoxious noise. Have you ever heard that when it's time to change it? But he had gotten to where he ignored that so long, he didn't even hear it anymore. I said, man, don't you hear that? Why don't you change the battery? He had ignored it so long that he no longer even heard it. He did not actually even hear it anymore. How many of you know that there's a danger when what is supposed to be a fire alarm, an alarm to let us know that we're entering into danger, or there could be a dangerous situation, if we ignore it long enough, we may fail to hear it. So it's important for us to deal with sin, not just deal with the subject, but to deal with it. 
because there can be some serious consequences. I know there have been serious consequences in my own life. I have observed, and you all have too, the consequences in other people's lives. And you know from your own lives, those areas where you have gotten outside of the will of God, which is also how we understand sin, that there can be some serious consequences. And if we don't deal with it, oftentimes it'll deal with us. How many of you have had sin deal with you? Someone who I know very closely, and sin can deal with us in a number of ways, but sometimes it'll manifest even in our bodies. Now, I want to give a qualification here. I am not saying that every time someone experiences a disease, it is the result of some personal sin and that God is getting even with us. I don't believe God operates that way, personally. But there are times within ourselves that sin will manifest itself even in our bodies, and I'll share with you what I mean. There's someone who I know very personally who had done something earlier in her life that caused a great deal of shame and guilt even while she was participating in it. There came a time where she had to be hospitalized because it created disease in her intestinal system, in her GI system. She was told by the doctors that there was nothing else they could do. They had performed an extensive surgery. There was nothing else they could do for her. She was on life support, and she had not days, but hours to live. So they invited her. This happened to be a Catholic hospital. They invited her to make peace with God, to make peace with the reality that life on this earth was getting ready to end. And in that moment, she prayed to a God, not knowing if God could even hear her. She prayed to God, and in that moment, God showed her that God had always forgiven her, that she had been carrying this shame and this guilt that she was forgiven. She had to forgive herself, but that sin was creating quite literally dis-ease in her body. If we do not deal with sin, sometimes sin will deal with us. Now, how are we going to deal with sin? It's noon, and I'm going to tell you a few ways very quickly because we want to know how to deal with sin. First of all, we have to have the desire to deal with sin. Now, some people say, well, of course, I have the desire to deal with sin. I want, I want to deal with sin, and I want to eliminate sin in my life. Really? Who was the person that said, Lord, save me, but not yet? <laughs> There are some of us that when we are honest, if there's something that is going on in our lives, we don't actually want to deal with that. We don't actually have the desire. I've caught myself at times when I've gotten a little entangled in something that I quite enjoy. Lord, I have the desire to take this. I'm going to need your help. Take it from me. And it's almost like in here, the voice of God coming back saying, you don't desire to let that go. You don't really want to let that go. So what we can pray for is the desire to have the desire to let that go. That's a first step we can take. If we do not actually have the desire to let something go in our lives, we can pray for the desire to have the desire to let it go. The next thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to recognize that we need to make a commitment to doing this. A commitment is not waffling. A commitment is a recognition where we come to that place, we're ready to deal with this, we have to commit to doing it. But how many of you know that a commitment is not a one-time deal? We have to make a commitment, and then we will find ourselves having to make commitments to that commitment. There are times in my own life when I make a commitment, and 30 minutes later I'm having to make a renewed commitment to that commitment I just made. Because it's one thing to have an emotional high or to get moved even in church and say, I'm going to deal with that thing. Jillian was in here a few weeks ago singing about lay it down, and I was, I was teary. I was ready to lay it down. But how many of you know on Monday morning it's not as easy to lay it down as in when Jillian singing? <laughs> we have to make a commitment to the commitment. There are a number of other ways, but I want to share this one with you. It is important for us to be a part of a community of faith. This is one of the ways that we deal with sin. Now, I didn't say church is this amorphous, abstract thing. I'm not talking about church, as sometimes we think of church. I'm not talking about institutionalization. As wonderful as this space that we have to worship in, I'm not talking about stained glass windows. I'm not talking about robes. I'm not talking about brass crosses. I'm talking about a community of faith. People who are also committed to overcoming sin. People who are also committed to growing in the love of God. Because it's actually as we grow in the love of God that sin cannot stay. That is how Jesus dealt with sin. 
He revealed perfect love. We were no longer afraid of God. He revealed God's perfect love. And as we grow in God's perfect love, we're not afraid so much of the consequences. We only want to live in the love of God. And it's in a community of faith that we are able to transcend and to deal with sin in our lives. Now, on a personal note and in closing, I know firsthand what it is like not to even care about sin, not to deal with the topic, to live a life not even concerned about God and what goes on in those buildings that they meet on on Sunday morning and other days during the week. We want to deal with sin because salvation is not just a matter of our eternal destination. That's important. It's vitally important. But it's also about the here and now. You all have heard me talk about my mother quite a bit, about the influence and the patient and that, patience and that kind of thing. But you haven't heard me speak much about my father, have you? My father was gone from the time I could even remember. He was gone before my earliest memories. And for a long time, and we celebrated Father's Day this past Sunday, for a long time Father's Day was a painful and a difficult day for me. There came a time as I grew in the knowledge of God's love that I was no longer mad at my father. It wasn't that I held anything against him. He was distracted. He was chasing things. He was doing other things. And he really, in many ways, didn't even know any better. But I realized this past Sunday on Father's Day how much he had missed. Sin is not about getting what we want. Overcoming sin is about getting what we really want. God wants the best for us. As I left this service and had the opportunity to greet so many of you, which is a special time in my week, every week just after this service, I drove home and as I was coming down the street, I could see two of my kids were hiding at the front door. <laughs> and they ran into the kitchen. And I knew something was getting ready to happen. And when I walked through that door, there they were. Valerie had cooked a seafood bake. There were a couple of presents, there was music, and there were the smiles on my children's faces. And I realized, by the grace of God, how rich, how full, how wonderful life is when I recognized the beauty of God's love, when I recognized the importance of a community of faith, the opportunity that we have to gather each week. My prayer for us this morning is that we will recognize it's important to deal with sin. We need to understand it. We need to know how it works. We need to know how it lurks. We need to know how it deceives us. We need to know that so that we can get to the place where we will deal with that sin. And we want to deal with that sin because God wants to fill our lives with love, wants to fill our lives with wholeness, wants to fill our lives with joy, wants to fill our lives with community, even this community of faith. That's my prayer for us this morning. Amen. If there's anyone here who has not begun that walk of faith, it begins with a confession of faith. And as I say each week, perhaps it would seem obvious to you all, but there was a time in my life where a confession of faith seemed scary to me. All this Jesus talk, religious talk, church talk seems scary. When you get down to it, it is about relationships. It's placing faith in the God revealed in <coughs> Jesus and knowing we can trust him. He is the one we can trust. For some of us, we're beginning to realize the importance of a community of faith. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot, but we are not on our own. We have a community of faith. I invite you to look around. This is an extraordinary, extraordinary community of faith filled with wonderful people. Each one of us has an opportunity. If we need to pray for the desire to have the desire, we can pray that. For some of us, we need to recommit to the commitment. Whatever we're being called to do, I invite you to stand and respond as God is leading you as we sing our hymn of commitment.
And now may the love of God that surpasses all understanding, the love which alone can break the power of sin and death, may that love guard and sustain our hearts this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.